Welcome to Rivenfield Ponds, this actual jewel in South Yorkshire's crown. It's an absolutely gorgeous, serene, scenic, it's a paradise. Now, we're looking around at sort of venues. Recently, we put a post out there and said to people, where do you want to fish? Where do you fish? Show us what your club water is. Now, we were always going to come to Ravenfield, which I'll explain in a little short while, but there were a few comments and said, why don't you come to Ravenfield Ponds and show everybody what we've got here? Well, today we're going to do that. Now, the reason why I was always going to come here anyway is because this is the place that I fished my first ever match 42 years ago. No, it might be 43 years ago. And uh, it holds great memories for me. It's stunning. Uh, I didn't really catch a lot that day. I think I had about six ounces of accidents in a tangled waggler and probably caught a few rud. Um, but today we're going to show you a little bit more about how to catch a few fish because I've learned a few tricks since then. Um, but Ravenfield is um, just this hideaway really and it's not far from where I live and it's the sort of place where you can come and fish and remember what you started fishing for really, the reasons why you went fishing. I mean, if you can hear what I can hear in the background, which is birds tweeting and a few trees rustling, then you'll remember that fishing is not always about the hectic, manic, chasing all over the country or even Europe, match fishing uh, and spending five hours of intense concentration trying to, you know, win every fish. Sometimes it's about sitting in a bit of a leafy pond with a few lilies and catching a few tench upside of, you know, lily pads and just enjoying your day and soaking up the atmosphere and taking a step away from the hectic modern life. So uh, we're going to just set up here on the Great Pond and try and catch you a few fish and give you an insight into Ravenfield Ponds. So we've set up on peg 63 on the Great Lake, which is sort of halfway up from the dam wall and the shallow end. And obviously you heard me mention that it's got these sort of islands which have got fixed fish sanctuaries underneath, which is wire cage uh, on the bottom, then a bit of a sort of cavity, and then a floating island over the top. That's to give fish somewhere to uh, take sanctuary from predators and things like that. So I've got one of those in front of me, I've got a nice gap, I've got some of these cracking stick-ups on the left-hand side. It's a nice open peg. I've got open water, I've got a margin swim, and I've got a bit of a feature to cast to. So, obviously, I don't really particularly, you know, know this venue that well. I've come down for a recce, had a bit of a look, and as I mentioned earlier, it's about 42 years since I actually fished my first ever match, which was just up the bank, probably three or four pegs up there. And I'm sure things have changed since then, because I certainly have. Uh, but what I want to try and do today is just fish nice and simple in a nice easy what I call a pleasure fishing style uh, so I've not got tons and tons of bait and I'm not trying to make life hard for myself by thrashing the water to a form I'm just going to keep fishing dead easy and probably like nice and cheap as well so I've got some pellets and some corn uh, I've got a bit of ground bait I have got a few casters which were left over from yesterday uh, and a few maggots for hook but, you know, I've not brought any worms and I'm not going to be thrashing pellets everywhere and, uh, you know, making a mess. So let's just see by taking a simple approach. I'm hoping there's a few tench, it's uh, sort of late May. They should be feeding well. We've had some, got some nice warm water because it's been sunny for a few days. Everything should be feeding. Um, I'm going to try and avoid the hide, but, you know, I might have a little chuck for them later just for a bit of fun because if we flick a few casters in, I'm sure they'll fill us peg and we could catch rod, roach. We could probably catch anything we wanted, depending on how we design our day's fishing. But let's, um, let's crack on and, and see how we go. So let's get started. Um, I've just plumbed up down by those stick ups there and it's about four, four, four and a half foot deep, which is, you know, it's not, it's not shallow, not like a carp commercial venue, but I think these sort of tench natural fish like a bit of cover over their head. So we've a chance of catching an odd bream, certainly looking to catch some of these tench and, and whatever else comes along the way. And I'm going to feed that with um, a few micros, which I've soaked up overnight in my little tub and a bit of corn just so that if we're not catching on a soft pellet, we can bob a piece of corn on, or if we're getting 
so the nuisance fish or just gives us an alternative bait and I'm just going to put them in nice and simple that's about five meters you can actually see them going down the water's not as colored as it might think when you look at it you think oh, it's got a lovely color to it and but these sort of natural venues uh, they can be quite like that and then I've got another swim which I've plumbed up and I'm just going to squeeze a few micros to pop them in a little hard ball just to get them down near the bottom which is a bit further out and that's close to about six six and a half foot and as I mentioned I want to try and fish in a sort of comfortable pleasure style fish so I've only got my top kit and then one two three pieces of pole because showing you a venue like this I want to fish in a way that I think you might want to fish if you came here not in what I call a bit of a hedonistic crazy you know match style 60 meters of pole and loads of gear and throwing everything around so let's just attack it in a steadier way and then I've clipped up my feeder my feeder rod to just fish off the just off the edge of those um, sunken islands and when I was plumbing up I was looking at I thought oh naturally I want to go between the two of them because that's kind of fish holding all but then I also thought it's quite a big lake there's a bit of a wind on and I would imagine that fish you know especially if the um, bream I know there's a lot of bream in here they would probably want to be in open water because ordinarily bream don't live in tight corners up against islands or in tight spots they like open water because the big shoal fish they like to swim around so I've actually opted for you'll just see that land just short of the front of them because I'd like to think that there's a little bit of undertow passing up and down in front of those islands and that'll give me more chance of catching fish than it will if I sort of go right into the lion's mouth what I also think is that that probably leaves the fish somewhere to back off into and they can back off into that little gap between the two islands oh near the pulp rod in I've just got a single maggot on and a 16 it's all barbless, barbless hooks here. We've got a nice 16 hook on. Well, that one's pulling back a bit. Nice soft rod. Remember, this is not full of 10 pound carp. There's a few good tension in it. They tell me Kingfisher Pond's got them up to five pound, but I think two pound would, two and a half pound would be an average on this lake but they reckon there's a lot of small ones as well which is great because that means they're breeding which has got to be a great sign for anybody look at that one. Ooh, that one behaved himself didn't he what a gorgeous fish look at that now I'm going to show my bad fish knowledge now because I know there's a difference between a male and a female tension so in the comments you can tell me because one's got you can define them I believe by the female. the fins so my learned friend behind me has informed me that's a female and I, I'm right in saying that that's because these fins here are slightly smaller oh there's an extra set of fins that's right these and these haven't got them look at that I'm going to put that back in my landing net before it slips because these tench are slippy, they're very slimy, which shows they're healthy. And I'm going to give myself two pounds, 14 ounces for that one. I'm not giving it a full three pound. But it's a great way to kick us off. And I just thought I'd start on a feeder while those short lines settle down, but if it continues like that, we'll probably finish up on it all day. Tench slime. If you want to know how to get that off, slide it down to the knot on your length and just flick it off like that. I'm sure you all know that, but for those who don't, if you've just started fishing, 
you've got that it's like a grey, very, very thick slime. I'm just going to put a few casters and a few pellets into that. I've got a nice small cage feeder and just cap it off with a bit of ground bait. That's a fish meal based ground bait because I know for a fact that like a lot of pleasure venues these days they see a lot of pellets and a lot of fish meal ground baits and I think naturally obviously pellets are very accessible they've got a long life so if you're a pleasure angler and you're an occasional fisherman you might not always have pre-planned your trip so in your garage you'll have a few pellets and I'm sure that applies to a lot of people that come here so they'll fish the pellets and the fish get used to that because they're full of protein they're full of food they're very they've got a lot of attractants in them because they smell when you you know you pick a pellet you can smell the fish meal in it like those there's some two mils of salt and that ground bait is basically like a broken down pellet because it's ground pellet and that's how they make a lovely fish meal ground bait like that you can see that probably on camera and that's almost like pellets that have been in the lake dissolved and turned into what, what's ultimately a ground bait. So it's no surprise that the fish have come straight to that. Why wouldn't you? I could eat it myself. Oh, indication, that looks like it's on. Yep. Slightly smaller fish. But you know you've hooked them on this lake, that feels like it could be either a small tench or one of them eight to ten ounce hide. Yeah. There's tons of these hide, because I know, speaking to the bailiff and the team here, that they've stocked a load of these fish and they're very giving a ride, they'll always oblige you with a few bites whatever the weather, whatever the time of year and they're great sport single maggot just keep repeating the process, pinch a bait and until you establish a swim and you start to get a feel of what's in front of you or how, you, how your day is going it's always best to, with something like this, a mixed fishery, where you're kind of just fishing for fish, not targeting, let's say, carp or just bream or, or just roach or something like that. Just feel your way in with your, that one we're pulling that out of my hand, look. Didn't even get my line sunk. Um, just steady away with your bait. Get a feel for it, find out what's happening in your swim and then adjust accordingly. And what I mean by that is that if there's loads and loads of small fish in your swim and they're eating all your bait, you might have to keep ploughing bait in to, to feed them up and attract some bigger and better fish. Or if there's not a lot of fish, you cut it back so that you're minimising the amount of bait in your peg and therefore maximising the opportunity of a fish picking up your bait rather than just free offerings. Because when all said and done, the name of the game is catching them, not just feeding them. So we'll play it by ear for now. Just try and, even though I didn't get the rod in the rest last time, and I think there's one trying to pull my rod in there. You, um, as your feeder lands, yeah, I thought so. Another fish. Well, it's one of chuck, isn't it? <laughs> what I was going to try and say to you is that as your feeder lands, if you can try and just time it so that your tip, tip of your rod, it's 
against the water as your feed is landing and then push your tip and therefore your line subsurface under the water and that'll just sink your line which will make seeing bites and fishing a little bit easier more importantly this time of year there's a lot of flora and fauna and fluff and seeds and all sorts of flowers coming off the trees and you'll see the surfaces scattered with petals and caterpillars I think we used to call them um, catkins and flies and all sorts and so there's quite a bit of rubbish floating about on top and what you don't want is that gathering on your line and then winding that into your rod tip clogging up the tip and snapping your prized quiver tip that's one thing you don't want so just try and do what I've just done there which is the feeder hits the water dip your rod underneath and sink your line and you're, you're fishing quicker whereas when you've got a bow in your line forgetting, forgetting about all that rubbish and protecting your tip you've got a big bow in your line and you can't see your bite properly because that line's under tension it makes a very very tight uh, line to your feeder I've got a free running rig on when the fish picks it up it's feeling that tension and you might not automatically get your bite it might uh, pick up the bait feel it and let go whereas you'll see I've got my, my tip set quite soft I've not got a big bend in it which I think is a great way of fishing especially at this short distance and just watch your tip and read your tip and try and understand what's happening under the water so you'll assume while I were talking then my tip just moved and I think that were a line bite because it was slow it weren't purposeful it weren't a dink dink or a jag or a pull me rod in it were just a and I think that's a line of the fish just catching the line on its fins and gave me what we call a liner and you've got to be sort of patient calm composed and not not striking at everything it's all about converting indications into fish you'll notice I'm actually holding my rod now there's two two styles I think when you feed a fish in is either to sit and hold your rod and if you've got fish like eyed roach rod you're probably going to need to strike at the bites from them strike them on whereas bream and tench you probably be quite uh, right to have a butt rest which I've got one here and if we get to the point where there's no small fish I'm not having to sort of be reactive just stick it in a butt rest and that sometimes can help you when you're fishing because it stops you from striking it like look at that well now I'm convinced that's a line bite which is why I've not struck at it almost as though the fish is sort of nosing around my feeder it's got the line around it but I, yeah and I think that's just moved out me you see it then it kind of went and you'd naturally want to pick up on that but by taking me hand off the rod and not striking so I think that's a line bite and it would just off the back of its fin and just leave it be I'm sure I've just heard an owl in the background this time of day let's have that out see if I've actually got any bait on because it seems odd that that tip's not gone flying round yep in fact that maggot's not even scared so we've either got something big in the swim because I know we've not caught them all Let's just reload and set the trap again. Just sinks lovely that.
you see the difference in that. That would definitely bite. Aye, aye. It must have swam towards me then. Completely different sort of action on a bite to a liner. So a liner, progressive, and it, you can see it flicks off its fins. Whereas that were, and this kind of repetitive, mm -mm, that's, that's when you know it's actually hooked. Oh, I've just seen that pop up. And that is another beautiful Ravenfield Great Pond tench on the feeder. And that'll just show you that we've kicked that off, kicked his little session off, and we've instantly had, had bites. But we're gonna try and catch you if you want pole and show you the potential. And look at that. What's not to love about that? And if you want to come down here just for a few hours feeder fishing, I'm sure you'll be able to catch these till your heart's content. And that one's got massive paddles on it. So I'm calling that a male. This is like a uh, fish anatomy class. Look at that one. Beautiful. Let's have a look what's happening on those other swims. So as the day's progressed, it's um, it's gone a bit harder and I can only put it down to the fact that it's probably the brightest day of the year so far. It's been warm overnight, real clear skies, sun's at its peak, midday, and a lot of fish have switched off. And them tinge completely disappeared, like, like I'd caught every single one of them. Um, I've dropped back in and had a look on that sort of deep water pellet line, that's sort of six, seven foot depth. Never even had a bite on that. And then I've gone down on my sort of bank of tench area, fell up to decent bream, and then not caught another fish down there, to be fair. And considering that I know it's absolutely black with fish, I've realized that obviously by just having a chuck around, it's just that the fish have switched off, which is midday, it's normal. Um, a lot of fisheries, especially sort of natural fish, the only thing that you can kind of catch uh, all the way through there, them big horrible cow that swim on top and you've got mug them and catch them. But this is a real fishery and you've got to take the rough with the smooth. So I started to feed a few casters over the top of that deep water line and it would have a chuck, they're feeding. Um, great spot, with a couple of small tench on that as well. And I've just come back out on this feeder line and there's an odd hide knocking about. So I think what's happened is all the fish that want to feed are kind of down the middle looking to, for a bit of shelter really. And it's just a great reminder that you can't just catch a fish every single cast wherever you go, no matter how good the place is like we did when we started today, chucked in and it's a tench, tench, tench. I didn't catch a tench, it went hard, had a couple of bream. But then the fish switch off. Now, if you have your session midday, you might find the fishing's a bit harder. If you come early morning and you leave before the sun comes up, you probably think that you could do that for 12 hours and it's not, that's not the way. The real wild creatures, you've got to think about that and factor in and that's why a lot of the time, especially as a match angle myself, I usually have fallback plans, plan A, B, C, and so on and so forth, all be adaptable. Now, obviously we've set this session out to fish in what I call the pleasure style, and ordinarily that might be that I just come, set my little 10 foot feeder rod up, fish up to that island. That In that case, you might struggle in the middle bit, or it might be really good then drop off, but just bear that in mind, and that's why it's always handy to have a second line which might be targeting different species and by Christ there's enough species in this place 
to probably make sure that you do get a bite every chuck, which I've proved by catching them perch short on that on that um, caster line. But we keep putting odd fish together. There's an odd eyed, I've just had a real good eyed on this, which I kinda had two or three fish where I've squeezed my feeder really hard, not to give away too many particles. I've probably spoke about that earlier and spoke about that before, to make sure that you're not just giving free offerings. When the going's a little bit tougher, you can't just keep plowing bait in and expect the few fish that are feeding to find your bait. And a cracking, cracking hide, probably a pound and a half, two pound. There's, there's tons of them in here, they go to four pound. Uh, but they're real tricky to catch, so when you do catch one, you probably feel quite content that you've you've tricked one. Then I would imagine there's other days when they want to feed and they're probably dead easy to catch, but that's not at this part of the session. But we'll keep feeding and progress along. And as the sun passes, I've no doubt we'll be back into fish. And that feels like another hide. feel like I'm starving them onto hook at a minute. Just squeezing that feeder nice and tight, no particles. So even if my ground bait does come out, which it has this time, then you're not actually leaving anything behind bar, buying a bit of a cloud of ground bait. Great spot. Six to eight ounce piece then. Real gap fillers. Got on corn here. Ruach. If you want to catch big roach, fish corn. Tip of the day. So I've continued to feed this inside line up against these stick holes because. I do know there's a lot of tench living these reeds because I saw them knocking this morning while we were fishing feed and catching tench. There were tapping reeds and all sorts. Anyway, I've been started on a pellet and I've had a few indications. And uh, I thought I'll just thought, try a piece of corn. I've just had a net roach, which were a nice welcome surprise. So I'm going to back in with corn and just feed a bit of corn cut the pellets out a little bit and just see if we can catch a few because bream are partial to a bit of corn, tench like corn. I think you'll catch hide on corn as well. So we'll just see. Because eventually, I mean this is four foot deep, eventually as the light does or the sun does kind of pass a little bit, they'll probably start feeding in this slightly shallower water because it's no coincidence that the best swim, best part of my swim, best part of my peg, has been the deepest one, which is obviously on the feeder. And I think that's sort of seven, seven, eight foot deep maybe. So it's probably just a depth thing versus daylight thing. And that's just something to consider when you're tackling a peg. You might want to fish in four foot, but is it the right place to fish in that day? And you know we spoke about the three fundamental things to consider when you're fishing, which is what do they want, wh oh, where do they want it, and when do they want it? I've forgotten I've still got some corn in my pot, so we're just trying to dribble a bit in. 50% of it when I went in and then my intention was to tip a bit more and halfway through my bite and I forgot. So I've spread a bit of corn all over the pond. 
how my, my feeder swim's fizzing. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and there you go, I better pull at that because that looks like it's a tench. I just saw them reeds knock. Caught me slightly unawares that one, but I think we've managed to clear it front peg. When it realises again that it's hooked. Oh, managed to, oh I'll tell you what, I thought that were a big tench and it's not. Look at the size of that. Wow, weren't expecting that. If I'm honest with you, I think uh, I don't really like quoting PBs. I once had one on Trent that were big, but I think that uh, will probably match it. Just going to take a look at that and lift that out to show you because that is a rather large eyed. They've told me about these eyed in Ravenfield. Well, they've told me about. The big eyed in Ravenfield, and they weren't kidding because there's one of them. Look at the size of that thing. A great big eyed. I've just had him on corn, fishing down the edge, up at the side of them reeds, looking for a tench. I thought it were a tench, but obviously, fish of that size are going to pull elastic out, whatever it is. Oh, there you go. I think that could be a tench. Piece of corn. Oh, yeah. Off it goes into the middle of the lake. Hopefully this uh, 10 to 12 should tame him. Have to be careful with these things because they've got a lovely habit of coming on the inside, turning you over and de-hooking you in the reeds. But I think we'll just keep him out there. And it's no coincidence that we've got some cloud cover. These fish don't like things over their head. They're not comfortable when it's bright. It's all about predation and their, how they feel about safety and whether they're comfortable feeding or not. Making a bit of an ash of that. I better bring the old puller into action, I think. Then they finished up eating my words and swapping a tench for a keep net. Here we go, look, here he is. Well. I'm gonna to pull too hard. But they don't have, they've got some rat paddles on them. I don't know who's in charge here. May all this tinge. Slightly, probably slightly bigger than the ones I caught earlier, but there he is, look. You don't want to give in. So what I've learnt so far is that I probably needed the next grain elastic up. I probably should have had a black in. But as long as we land him, we can say we enjoyed a good fight. Here he is, look. Oh yeah. He's an absolute beauty. It's a great fish to finish on. That inside line. Let me just drop my rig because I want to show you that in its full glory. It's absolutely stunning, that fish. A true natural water beauty and if you like to get your string pulled and get towed around the lake like I just did fetch yourself to Ravenfield on the Great Lake catch fish like that beautiful <laughs>